Well, welcome everyone to Hope Church this morning. Um, welcome to those that have made it here now anyway. Um, what we're going to be doing today is continuing our series in the letter to the Galatians. That's something we actually began before the pandemic, and I'm aiming to finish that uh, this month. And um, we, we send out a monthly sort of bulletin with information about what's going on in the coming, in the coming month. Uh, if you, um, that's sent out by Simon. If you, if you don't get that, then please uh, talk to us and we'll um, make sure you receive that. One other thing you can pick up um, in uh, physical form this morning is the Biblical Creation Trust prayer letter. That's uh, the other part of uh, my work, and um, you can pick that up on the table by the door. So this week we have our prayer meeting in the chapel here on Wednesday at half past seven. And we also have another opportunity for prayer on Saturday morning. So if you can't make it in the week, uh, can you gather for prayer at nine o'clock for half an hour on Saturday morning? That's another chance for us to pray together. And um, one other thing just to note, next Sunday is Remembrance Sunday, uh, which means that there will be various parades and things going on in town, which will mean some of the roads uh, around here may be um, blocked off. So just bear that in mind in giving yourself enough time to get here. Well, we're going to begin this morning with God's promise, a promise that God gave in the Old Testament from uh, Ezekiel. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws." See, this is God's promise of the Holy Spirit sent after Jesus' resurrection. We live in the age of the Spirit today. He is the one who gives us new life in Christ. He is the one who gives us new, new desires so that we want to turn from sin and to follow God. Look at that. I, I will put my Spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. And that is what we see, uh, exactly the same message uh, in the book of Galatians. It's all there in the Old Testament ahead of time. So let's sing, first of all, this morning, a hymn that um, is a bit like a sort of energy protein bar of all sorts of great theology packed together in small compass, all about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And he, this hymn just beautifully expresses uh, what a gift the Holy Spirit is to his people. So let's stand and sing together.
please sit down. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are not distant. You have not left us alone, but that you have come near to us in the gospel of your Son. We thank you that you sent your Son, that he became one of us. We thank you that he identified with us even to the extent of taking our sin, of nailing that to the cross. And we thank you that when that earthly ministry ended, you sent the Holy Spirit that we would not be alone. We thank you that we share in that resurrection life of the Lord Jesus through the Holy Spirit. We thank you that he indwells every one of your people. And we praise you for such an incredible gift that your very presence is in us. We praise you for the ministry of your spirit who has given us life, who has made us to be born again. We praise you that he shows us the Lord Jesus. He takes his words, his life, and he brings that to us. He applies that to us. We thank you for how he assures us of your love. He assures us that we belong to you, that we are accepted by you. We thank you it is by the Holy Spirit that we can pray, that we can cry out, Abba, Father. We can come to you in that family, um, close way. And we praise you that the Holy Spirit walks with us in that battle with sin. We thank you that he is changing us from the inside, changing our desires. And it is our prayer today that we would increasingly see the ministry of your Holy Spirit amongst us. May we see that ministry in waking the dead amongst us today. Those here who as yet have not trusted you, who are still dead in their sins, who are still under your condemnation. Heavenly Father, we pray, grant that gift of life. May your Holy Spirit work to bring about that new birth. We pray, Lord, that you would speak through your word today. This word inspired by the Holy Spirit. May he apply that to us individually in the ministry today. We pray that he would change us, he would empower us that we would be enabled to live lives that are more honouring to you, that are more Christ-like, that are more useful in your service. And Father, we pray, as well for ourselves, we pray for this town, we pray for this land, we pray that we would see the Holy Spirit at work in a far greater way in these days. In the midst of the, the confusion, the idolatry, the... Uh, blindness to the truth, we pray that the Holy Spirit would come in convicting power to draw many, many people to the Lord Jesus as their Savior. Heavenly Father, be at work amongst us, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to come now to our reading from Paul's letter to the Galatians. Um, some of the, this has been a sort of a series, the more recent things are there on, on our YouTube channel. The other messages from before the pandemic are there on the website. And uh, just a reminder of um, a few weeks ago, I was trying to sort of help us sort of su- summarize the message of Galatians um, in terms of two pets. Um, there's the false gospel that the Galatians were falling for that's like being in a hamster wheel, where it's all down to you, it's all about your effort. That is how you, find, you try and find salvation. That's a false gospel. But then there's the true gospel that Christ saves, where we are joined to Christ. We share our life with him. More like uh, the picture here 
of this dog. And just have that in mind, even in the reading today, because the two kinds of life we're going to be reading about result from these two different Gospels. That's the key message of today. So let's, um, let's come now to Galatians uh, 5 from verse 13. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, Jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. We're going to come back uh, to those fruit of the Spirit in a moment, but first of all, we're going to sing once more uh, this uh, great reminder of the God of our salvation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son. Let's stand and sing this together. sit down. Well, I wonder if anyone can tell me what's growing 
on these trees. Or at least was. It's, a, it's an old photograph. This comes back from 1957. So um, not many of us would have been uh, around then. Any ideas, Dick? Spaghetti. Spaghetti, thank you, yeah. Spaghetti <laughs> on trees, yeah. This, th there's a clue, okay. This was broadcast on the 1st of April, okay, um, on, a, on a current affairs program on the BBC in 1957, and it was reporting on the bumper spaghetti harvest that there'd been um, down in, in southern Switzerland, I think. Um, the spaghetti weevil had been almost eradicated and there'd been a dry winter, which meant you had a really good spaghetti harvest. Anyone spot a problem? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> well, actually, let's ask you, yeah. Um, April 1st is April. Oh, right, April Fool's Day, right, yeah. So, spaghetti doesn't grow on trees. This was just stuck on. It did fool a lot of people, though. Um, now, we've been reading about the fruit of the Spirit. These are not fruit that are stuck on a tree. It's not like the spaghetti that was stuck on, uh, on those trees. The fruit of the Spirit is not about looking good on the outside. You know, sometimes you can be sort of kind and good because you're told to. Maybe, um, you know, your teacher's telling you at school, you know, there's an inspector coming, I really need you to behave, and maybe they threaten you with sort of dire punishments if you don't. So, so you do behave, but you don't really want to. That's sort of fruit on the outside. What the fruit of the Spirit is, is fruit that grows from the inside, from what we are, from what we really want. So when you trust Christ, when you ask him to forgive you for your sins, he changes you from the inside. So you start to want what he wants. So let me just give you an example of this. The last thing in that list is self-control. Well, imagine a situation where you are maybe jealous of someone. They've got something that you want. Maybe it's a, a toy or a gadget, or they've been able to go on a holiday that you would have loved to have gone to, or, or maybe they're just getting all the attention. And you feel angry, you feel upset, and you are tempted to maybe lose your temper. You're tempted to maybe be nasty to them. So you've got all these emotions inside you, this sort of anger, and um, you're, you're, you're jealous, you're, you're just really cross about it. It's just so unfair. And it's a bit like having all these things inside you, and you're trying to self-control, you know, hold the lid down, just hold it all in, be really, be really strong in yourself and just try and hold it all together and sort of keep the suitcase shut. And if you've got a big enough weight on it, you can maybe just about shut the suitcase. That is not self-control, or at least that is not the self-control that Paul is talking about here. The self-control that we need is where it, it comes from a change on the inside, where the Holy Spirit changes our desires and puts them, if you like, in a proper order. So, it's a bit like sort of folding up the clothes. And so, as we face this situation, we think, well, hang on a minute. As God's child, I've got all his attention. I mean, what more do I want? What's the matter if someone else has got more attention than me? I've got God's attention. And, okay, other people have got nice things, but think of what God has given to me. Isn't this incredible that he has uh, been so kind to me? And maybe you, you think, um, well, actually, I can be glad for the other person. Isn't it great that they can go on this holiday? Maybe that is something that they really need. 
I can actually be joyful at what they are enjoying, as opposed to being jealous for what I don't have. And so you see what's going on. The things going on inside me are being sort of folded up. They're being changed. And as we do that, what's our inside is different. And now it shuts very straightforwardly. Just about managed to get that right. So that is self-control. It's not come from sticking on the suitcase and trying to hold it all shut and being, I'm really going to be self-controlled. It's not that. It's our desires changing so that all those things that were making us want to blow up have been changed. And that is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit changes us from the inside. So when we're tempted, ask the Holy Spirit to help you, to change you from the inside, to remind you of what Jesus has done for you. So before we come to uh, look at that passage in more detail in Galatians, we're going to sing once more. Um, great first line, isn't it? Fight the good fight. We were thinking last time how this is a massive battle. When you become a Christian, when you... Um, are brought into this freedom of the Christian life. It's not a freedom from difficulty. It's a freedom to fight. Actually, the, the, the battle's almost only just begun. There's a fierce battle going on between that, that battle for sin and that battle to follow Christ. And this hymn helpfully puts that together. And I love the, the line there you've got at the end of verse 2. Christ is the path and Christ the prize. We're following him. We're following a person. He is the one who helps us. He is the one who we want. So let's stand and sing this together. Fight the good fight. Please sit down. <clears throat> there is a, a sheet available on the table at the front that goes with uh, the message this morning, with the sort of headings and stuff I've got on here and some other questions. And at the end of this month, um, we'll, we'll try out one of our Sunday afternoon meetings where we will be discussing some of these most recent sermons on Galatians. <clears throat> Well, I wonder if you've ever heard someone saying this or maybe thought this yourself. You know, I like, I like the Christian ethics, I like the Christian morality, but not the Christian gospel. Or, or I'll happily accept Jesus' teaching, but not all that Son of God stuff and all the miracles. Well, I'm not sure that someone can really say that if they've actually read 
what Jesus' teaching actually was. Um, here's a, just a, an example, almost at random. Um, this is something, something that Jesus taught. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. That's Jesus' teaching. And you can see that his teaching is totally tied to who Jesus is. He's saying it's all about me and that somehow I am so much more important than even the closest of human relationships, than even your very life. You see, the two go together, how you live and who Jesus is. So understand this, that Christianity is not some sort of religious system or ethical system. It's a person. It is centred on Christ. That great summary statement in Galatians, that, that Christ is formed in you. And you see, in Christ, we are connected to two other, pa- two other people who are the same God. Because you see, Christ, the Son of God, was sent by the Father. He was sent by the Father to die on the cross for our sin, to rise again. And the Holy Spirit was sent to unite us to Christ when we trust in him. It is through the Holy Spirit we then cry out to the Father in prayer that we are children of God. We are brought into this new relationship where we know God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be a Christian. It means to be accepted, to belong to, belong to this God, to be forgiven by this God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that is why the Spirit's work is actually a major focus in Galatians. I think, if anything, I've not emphasized this enough. And so, in, particularly in chapter 5, we see the, the evidence of the Spirit's work in someone's life is a changed life. It's a Christ-like life. Last time we were thinking about how there's no contradiction between the message that we have in the first four chapters of Galatians, that we are not saved, that we are not accepted by God through what we do. There's that great message going through chapters 1 to 4. And then in chapters 5 and 6, we're told how we live really matters. Those two are not contradictory because the Christ who saves us is the Christ who lives in us, who dwells in us, by his spirit. That's what we tried to explain last time. And so that means that this gospel of grace, this gospel of Christ, leads to a life that is characterized by the fruit of the spirit, what we're going to be focusing on this week. It was the wrong gospel of the the false teachers, these people called agitators, in the Galatian churches that had led to the very problems that Paul is trying to address in this letter. And what were those problems? Those problems were the divisions you had between Jew and Gentile. He speaks in this chapter about them biting and devouring each other. At the end of the chapter, people becoming conceited, provoking and envying each other. Their relationships were going wrong. And they were going wrong because their theology was wrong. The problems in the church were not through a lack of rules or not enough rules. It was because they weren't living out the true gospel. They were not living by the Spirit. And it's a lesson that we need to learn for ourselves. It's the same for us in the church but it actually also applies everywhere else too, in our friendships, our marriages, indeed in the whole of society, all our interaction with one another. And what could be more relevant when you look at how vicious so much uh, interaction is today on social media and just in other ways, just how much ugliness there is in how we even speak to one another. Well, ultimately, the answer to that 
It's not more rules. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's look at how that is the case. And in this this section from verse 19, Paul gets down to some detail. He is beautifully specific. He doesn't just deal in generalities. We can sometimes do that with sin. Yeah, I've been a bit sinful recently. No, no, let's, let's name the sins. Let's be specific. He actually gives us lists. And he characterizes two ways of life. What is called here the, the acts or the works of the sinful nature or also translated the flesh. That's referring to our sort of fallen condition as human, people, as human beings where we are hostile to God. It's our sinful desires. It's, it's innate to how we are born into this world. And he contrasts that with this life that is the fruit of the Spirit. And just note there are only two ways to live. Everything's terribly simple. You know, there's, there's a whole myriad of different religions, different self-help philosophies, all sorts of other stuff out there. It's actually terribly simple. They all boil down to two. You're either on one or other of these two paths. And when he's describing these, these two ways to live... He is talking about a sort of a path, a direction of travel. It's not simply isolated acts, but a sort of habitual pattern of life. He's talking about living like this. This is about a pattern. And when he lists these acts of the sinful nature, this is not exhaustive. It's, it's, he's not listing everything. He says, you know, and the like at the end. And they're not necessarily all present in equal measure, or at least not obviously so. This isn't some sort of tick list to uh, to sort of see which ones you fall into. And there's also obviously a lot of overlap, as we shall see, between the different words here. He begins with um, these sexual sins, sexual immorality. That's just a general term for it. Impurity, what makes us feel dirty. Debauchery. It's the idea of no restraint, pushing the boundaries as to what is acceptable. And then there's two sins of false religion, idolatry and witchcraft. Witchcraft really meaning the sort of manipulating powers of evil. And then there's eight sins on how we relate to one another. Hatred. Discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Talking about the sort of party spirit that you can get in the sense of siding with different groups, maybe siding with others to pursue your agenda. The sort of polarization that we see all the time in our world today. And it is exactly what was going on in the Galatian churches. And then at the end, there's two sins, if you like, of excess, drunkenness and orgies. It's this idea of lack of self-control. But you sort of get the idea, don't you? What is it that unites all of these different sins? Well, they're all characterized by a focus on self. Where other people are involved, they are there as tools to benefit me. They're, about, they're there for my satisfaction, for my agenda. If they don't give me what I need and what I want, I'll ditch them. The focus is on self. It's about my desires, what I want. So the motivation, the driving power, what energizes this sort of life is me. It is self. Well, what if instead it is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the one who unites us to the God of three persons. The God who is love. 
now your focus of life is going to be very different. Now the focus is on others, not on self. And this is where I think we sometimes go wrong. We tend to read this list of fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We tend to read it quite individualistically. It's about sort of inner love, inner joy, inner peace. But remember what Paul's trying to address here. It's problems in the church, problems between different Christians. He's addressing relationships within the church. So the focus here is actually on love for others. Joy in others. So you're not seeing other people as rivals or people you have to compare with. You actually can rejoice in in the things that are going well for them. It's about peace, not in some sort of inner peace, but peace with others. Your relationship with others. And obviously the patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, well that all involves other people, doesn't it? Gentleness, really it means a lack of self-importance. You're not thinking too much of yourself, you're not throwing your weight around. And self-control, it's a sort of contentment, so that you're not thinking of self. And it's precisely because of that that you can serve others. So my conclusion from that is that you can't display the fruit of the Spirit on your own. When you're isolated from other people. Sometimes people think, oh, the peak of my spiritual life would be when I'm away from everyone else, I can get on a mountaintop and just focus on God. You won't be displaying any of these fruit of the Spirit if that is your ambition in the Christian life. The fruit of the Spirit is seen when you're part of a church, immersed in a church, interacting with real people, and in particular with sinful real people. The fruit of the Spirit is seen in the muck of life. You show patience and kindness in a community of sinners who upset you. The fruit of the Spirit are shown in the context of sin. It's the danger of all the online stuff. Simply watching messages online does not enable you to display the fruit of the Spirit. You actually have to interact with real people at some point. The second thing to notice is that it's not a pick and mix selection. It's not that you sort of look at this list and think, well, I'll I'll pick those those four maybe. I'll, I'll, I'll have those and not worry so much about the others. No, 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 all of these go together. They're interdependent. When you think about it, if you grow in joy, you're going to grow in gentleness. If you grow in peace, you're going to grow in patience. There's a sort of unity to this fruit because it comes from a single source. It comes from the Spirit. And really, you can best understand the fruit of the Spirit as as Christ-likeness. Ultimately, this is a description of Christ. This is describing what God is like. Think of what Jesus once said, Matthew 11, 29, I am gentle and humble in heart. Jesus was displaying these fruit of the Spirit. And they are really very gospel-centered. You see the fruit of the Spirit in sort of three dimensions and in full color in the gospel. Because it is God who shows goodness and kindness and patience to sinners. He loves the ungodly. That's the fruit of the Spirit. And what I want us to understand is that these two different patterns of life, these two ways to live, they match, they correlate, if you like, with the two Gospels that Paul has spoken about. Right at the start of the letter, he, he talks about um, being so concerned that the Galatians were turning to a different Gospel, which is really no Gospel at all. 
It's a false gospel. And he's saying that gospel leads to this pattern of life of the acts of the sinful nature. The true gospel leads to the fruit of the Spirit. So let's look at how that works. And I'm going to start with a negative. Because however much you say what I've been saying, people still get the wrong idea. And some of you may well be thinking, oh, I know what you're saying. You're saying there's good people and bad people. You're saying there's nasty people and nice people. There's religious people and the sort of non-religious pagan people. That's, that's the sort of two groups you're talking about. No, I'm not. That isn't what I'm saying. If that's what you're thinking, you are misunderstanding this, okay? You can put it like this. There are good and bad people, and then there are Jesus people. Those are the distinctions. Let me try and unpack that a bit. It's a something slightly odd that Paul should list these sins in this way in verses 19 to 21, because what he's describing would sort of resonate with the Galatians with the sort of pagan lifestyle that many of them had been saved out of, which seems like an odd thing to do when the issue in Galatia were these false teachers that were wanting the Galatians to follow the Old Testament Jewish law. But Paul is doing that very deliberately. He is saying something incredibly shocking. It's, it's the same thing that he said back in chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. He is basically saying this, that if you're going to go back to the Old Testament Jewish law in the way that the false teachers want you to, that would be equivalent to being a Gentile pagan again. You know, the Jewish false teachers would think that's, that's crazy. You know, the whole point about the Jewish law is it's to separate us from people like that. But Paul says, no, no, no. If that is the, what you go back to as your way of being made right with God, it's actually no different to the pagans. So in their sort of obsession with physical flesh, circumcision, these false teachers, he's saying, look, you're going to end up with a life that's governed by the flesh in a spiritual sense, this sinful nature. Well, to put it more simply, both good and bad people can be living according to the sinful nature. You can have people that seem both good and bad, but are both living according to the sinful nature. Just think of Jesus' parable, what we call the prodigal son, or really the parable of the two sons. The younger son was obviously bad. He wanted his father dead, he took the money, he wasted it on the sort of lifestyle that is described in that list of sins. The elder son was good. He stayed at home. He worked hard, he obeyed. But by the end of the parable, you realize actually he hated his father too. He was jealous, he was envious, he was angry. That parable, you get a great temper tantrum at the end. Oh, that's the same thing as we find in this list of sins. You see, both the older son and the younger son were both following the sinful nature. Their lifestyles looked a bit different superficially, but they were both following the sinful nature. It was just shown in different ways. And so the Pharisees of Jesus' day were moral people, respectable people, and yet they were full of hatred. It's one of the things that comes out in the Gospels, their hatred towards Jesus. How is that evidenced in the end? Well, they're the ones that want Jesus killed. That's pretty extreme hatred, isn't it? And these were the moral, religious, good people. Paul himself had been a Pharisee, and he was very keen on getting people murdered who followed You see, the issue is not how good or bad you might think you are. It's what do you think of Jesus? Do you trust him? Do you follow him? 
Have you got the right gospel? You see, there's this false gospel of self-salvation. The gospel of the, the hamster wheel. This is where you're finding your acceptance, your value with God, or indeed with other people, through what you do, through what you achieve. And that false gospel leads to the acts, to the works of the sinful nature. Note the word works. It's actually the same word there that Paul described talking about the false gospel being linked to the works of the law. So the works of the law end up in the works of the sinful nature. Working hard to save yourself leads to a life that is focused on self. Let me give you some examples. Why do people fall into sexual sins or sins of excess? Well, one reason is seeking pleasure as a reward. This idea that I've earned it. You know, I've worked so hard... I've been so badly treated. I'm a victim. I deserve some fun. That is often what is going on when people fall for sexual temptation. It is the idea of reward. Somehow there's something I've earned because my life's so miserable or whatever. Or maybe if your life is focused on success, on popularity... That is where you find your acceptance, your value. Well, that immediately puts you in competition with others. You're going to be comparing with others. And what's going to flow from that? Jealousy, envy, selfish ambition. Do you see how it's, if that's your your way of life, if that's how you're trying to, 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 as it were, be right, then that is what will result. It's this way of life. Or maybe salvation for you, being in the right, comes from following the right causes. For some people, maybe following the LGBT agenda. Well, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because look at some of the hatred, the rage, the factions that are actually within that group, people that would seem to be aligned along that way of thinking, are actually in civil war with one another. The case of that uh, academic in the University of Sussex, Kathleen Stock, this week. The vitriol has come from people within almost her own group. And this is what we always see. However laudable the... um, um, the agenda might be. However, um, you know, you could have an organisation promoting motherhood and apple pie. And in the end, these sins would still be present. You would start getting factions and division. Because you're not following the true gospel. But let's not lose sight of of an application, if you like, that's going on in, in Galatia. There's an application in the church. You know, Christians can sometimes talk about uh, needing to be separate from the world, which indeed is, is, is right. But we can fail to notice how the world isn't out there. It's actually in here. It's actually embedded in ourselves. You see, if you're someone that's trying to gain God's approval through how faithful you are, how sound you are, how hard you work in church. If that is why you think God should be pleased with you, you are following a false gospel. And the life that will follow will be characterized by discord and factions and selfish ambition and all sorts of other sins as well. You know, what lies behind some of the... the, the falling away of some high-profile ministers. It's exactly this principle. You're following a false gospel, a gospel of self-salvation that leads to these works of the flesh. But there's the true salvation. 
what I've called here spirit salvation, by which I mean that we are saved through Christ's death and resurrection, and we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That is something totally different, because it is not something focused on ourselves, it is now a relationship. It is something living, hence it produces fruit. This new life is not out of gratitude. Sometimes Christians think, oh, you know, the reason I should, I should live differently now, I'm a Christian, is out of gratitude to God. That's, that's a very poor reason. The reason we are to live a new life is because we are new people. We have a new identity. As Paul puts it here, we belong to Christ Jesus. And we're joined to Christ Jesus by his spirit who lives in us. And the Spirit is the one who changes our life. He changes us from the inside. He changes our motivation, our desires, what we delight in. What we read at the start of the service from Ezekiel 36. I will put my Spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You see, the Spirit is changing us to move us to do that. So we delight to show patience because we've been overwhelmed by the patience that God has shown to us. It becomes part of us. We can be truly joyful in others, in others' achievements and successes because God has accepted me. He's welcomed me as I am. Other people are no longer a threat. It's precisely because I am secure in Christ that I don't need to worry about myself and my reputation. I'm free to serve others. So the fruit of the Spirit is not niceness. It's not natural. You know, some people can be naturally placid or happy. That is not the fruit of the Spirit. You can have the sort of imitation fruit, just like you can have imitation trainers and anything else, something that that looks a bit like it, but it's a bit like that spaghetti. It's not a product of the tree. It's stuck on. The real fruit here is something that grows out of the gospel. So there's joy when circumstances are not joyful. When someone else's success doesn't reflect well on you. When you're loving the unlovely. When you're patient with the obnoxious. When there's self-control, not from holding everything in with sheer willpower, but because of changed desires. This is very powerful. You know, Satan can produce miracles. That's why we shouldn't be deceived by them. He can't produce the fruit of the Spirit. So the answer to sin is not law. That doesn't change what we want. Simply having more rules, that's the the only answer our society can ever offer. If there's a problem, let's have some more rules and some tighter rules. Ironic, isn't it? You know, Christians characterize as people all, all about rules. Well, actually, no, no, it's our society that's all about rules. But they don't work. It's the same thing as the false teachers were saying. It isn't the law that would stop the Galatians from living like Gentile pagans, but the Spirit. It is through the fruit of the Spirit that the law's demands are met. Against such things, there is no law. So, where does this leave us? We've got these two ways to live that are linked to two different Gospels. Well, there's one choice. And it's not that you're at a T-junction and you can either go this way or go this way. No, no, you're already on one of these paths. You're all on the path of the sinful nature unless you choose to trust Christ and follow him. If you simply do nothing, if you simply stay as you are, Paul says you have no place in the kingdom of God. That's the very thing that the Jews thought was theirs, the kingdom of God. These false teachers would have thought, well, the kingdom of God, that's ours. Paul's saying, no, you don't get it through this false gospel. Actually, what this, this false gospel takes you to hell, not to heaven. 
The kingdom is not something you earn. As he puts it here, you inherit the kingdom of God. Not by what you do, but through being a child of God, belonging to Christ. So there's a choice to be made today. You need to choose Christ. If you don't want to carry on on this path of the sinful nature and where that leads, you actually need to trust Christ for yourself. But if you have made that choice, you still need to do something in this sense. You see, you're not more holy or Christ-like just from having listened to a sermon on the fruit of the Spirit. It doesn't just sort of um, work over you uh, in some magical way. You need to be what you are. Verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. I think Paul here is talking about when we first repent, when we first turn to Christ. When you do that, you are making a choice. You are choosing Christ over sin. And so, if you like, you're putting the sinful nature on the cross. You're crucifying it. You're saying you're done with that way of life. You're done with that way of life that Christ died for on the cross. And you're now going to live for Christ. But remember, crucifixion is not instant destruction. It's a slow, lingering, painful process. We are thinking last time, this battle we're in. But there is a certain outcome. So it means in the Christian life, you have to remember, no, no, I've already, dis- you don't negotiate with sin. You don't decide, well, shall I give in to this or not? You've already made that decision. You've crucified the sinful nature. You've put it to death, so, so there's no reason to give in to it in the present. You don't negotiate with sin. You live out what you have already decided. So you've crucified the sinful nature. But in the present, you need to keep in step with the Spirit. This is a command. It's talking about, we talked before about walking with the Spirit, that that daily, ordinary walk, living in, in step with the Spirit. Sort of walking in line with the Spirit is the idea here. And this is something so encouraging because he is a person who is with us, who empowers us, who changes us. And it means this, you you, you can't do two things at once. So you replace sin with the fruit of the Spirit. So when you're tempted to self-pity, you find someone that you can show kindness to. That when you're provoked, when you're unfairly treated, you apply the gospel. And you remember how God treated you. And you then do the same to us. You don't give in to the sinful nature by walking with the Spirit. So this battle with sin is won in the same way that we were first saved from sin's condemnation. It's not willpower, it's through looking to Christ, trusting in Christ. It's choosing Christ rather than sin. That's what living by the Spirit truly means. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before you because we are so easily deceived, because that sinful nature still speaks so powerfully to us. We are still in this battle. We still fail. Which is why we thank you for the great gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is the one who has conquered for us. He is the one who has paid for our sin. He is the one who has lived this perfect life under the onslaught of temptation that we cannot live. That he has lived that for us. 
that that is how we can be accepted before you. That is how we can be right with you today. That is how we can be certain of your goodness and, and, and kindness towards us. And we ask, Lord, that with that certainty in our heart, that we would live as your people, that we would live as people of the Spirit. We would live in step with the Spirit. Help us in this fight. Help us to want this. Help us to want the fruit of the Spirit. Help us to grow in this. Help us to help one another to grow in this. Father, speak to us now and apply this in our own hearts, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're going to come to the Lord's Supper in a moment, but uh, let's, let's have a, a short break uh, for now, and then we will come back and we will sing, um, first of all, uh, when we come to that. <clears throat> and we're going to uh, begin with this, uh, this hymn, O great God of highest heaven, occupy my lowly heart, own it all, and reign supreme. So it's a, it's a great hymn that, that responds really to that message from Galatians this morning. So let's stand and sing this together. Please sit down. I just want to take you to some verses that very much parallel what we've been looking at in Galatians. Here from Colossians 3. <clears throat> Put to death, same idea of crucify, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, <clears throat> but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. You see, he's giving the reason there should be this change. You have put on the new self, which is be being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. You have a new identity, he's saying. There is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. You see, what really matters is that you are in Christ, not all these other things that are sort of part of your background. That isn't the big thing anymore. Your identity is now in Christ. And then look what he says as he's speaking here to the church. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves 
with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. See these qualities about how we relate to one another in the church in the first place. And then he says this, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And look what he's referring to there. It's not simply something sort of within for us personally, since as members of one body you were called to peace. He's talking about peace with one another. Dealing with the tensions, the disagreements, the fallings out. And they love this, and be thankful. Well, don't worry, we won't go into all of that now. You won't get another second sermon. But what's all this got to do with the Lord's Supper? Well, I guess it's this idea. The Lord's Supper isn't something you can have on your own, in this sense, because it's about the family of the church. It's about a family of sinners. It's about people with whom things can have gone wrong. You can have grievances. So, so what is it that holds the church together? Because there's often not a lot else that, that is sort of naturally uniting us. You know, if you have a sort of load of football supporters, there, they're supporting the same team. That's what's holding them together. You've got similar interests or whatever. You don't necessarily have that in the church. So what on earth is it that stops the whole thing from imploding? Well, it's the gospel crucial thing here in verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. How? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. You see, what does the Lord's Supper remind us of? It reminds us of the broken body and the shed blood of Christ. It reminds us of his sacrifice on the cross which was precisely to pay for sin. That is the reason that we're able to forgive, because sin has already been paid for. And we can forgive our brothers and sisters because God has forgiven us, and indeed he's forgiven them. How can I hold grudges against my brother and sister when God has shown infinite patience and kindness to me? in the gospel. Yes, I have been wronged. No one's disputing that. But I have wronged my God. And that is a far greater offence. Do you see how this works? It's, It's in the light of the gospel, the massive forgiveness, the massive kindness of the gospel. That has to change how we relate to one another. Which means the Lord's Supper is a very serious thing. It is a commitment before God to pursue this life of forgiveness and love to people that he has joined us to in the church. Not in some vague sense of Christians generally somewhere, but people, actual people we know that we meet with, that we're committed to. And so it's that sort of concept of church that that is why we, I guess, we have this practice in uh, this fellowship here where we will um, give the bread and the juice to those who have trusted Christ, to those who have publicly shown that in baptism, which is a very symbol of our union with Christ, of being crucified and raised with him, and then committed themselves to the body of Christ here to this group of people. That is what's going on here. So let's pray as we come to the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. We thank you for these amazing words, as the Lord forgave you. We thank you that there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness with you. It is not our right, it is not what we deserve, but it is what we have received from your lavish grace, from 
the sacrifice of your son, no less. Lord, we praise you for your goodness. We praise you for the lengths that you have gone to to rescue your enemies. And we pray that this would refresh us this morning, that we would be grounded again in these basics of the gospel that we must never move on from, that need to shape our lives more and more. We pray, Father, for this fellowship. We pray that we would truly grow together in unity in the Lord Jesus. We would grow together in these fruit of the Spirit. We pray, Father, that you would add to our number, that others would want to commit themselves to your work here, that we would see people turning to trust you, to see that this sacrifice of the Lord Jesus is not just something to hear about coming week by week, but it is, this is the person they need to trust in today. And for those maybe needing to be baptized, to make that public commitment, that, that symbol of that union with the Lord Jesus. We pray, Father, move us all forward together, we ask. Encourage us through this time. And above all, Lord, may this fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Let's finish with a final song. Let love be found among us, a love from God alone, the hallmark of the children whom God delights to own. Let's stand and sing. Please sit down. <clears throat> Let's close in prayer. We thank you for how deeply you have loved us. We thank you for this love which never ends. We thank you that you are truly the originator, the expert on love. And we pray that we would learn from you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to learn from you what love is truly means and to display that in our lives, in our lives together as your people, in our lives throughout this week at home, at work, in every situation that we are in. May we live consistently as your people and display a Christ-likeness that will bring glory to his name and cause people to ask, why do you do this? Why do you live like this? and that we might point to our great Saviour. Help us now, we pray. Encourage us together, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.